Are you introducing me, Chad, or just go for it? Sweet. <laughs> All right, hi everyone, I'm Chad. I'm the director of Free Play. Um, am I up? I'm up. Cool, okay. Hi everyone. Um, the light's very bright. I presume you're out there. My name's Tim Colwell. Um, I'm here to talk to you about a union for game workers in Australia. Uh, what it is, why we need one, and how we can go about getting it. So I guess I'd like to take, uh, like to take a moment to thank Free Play and Chad particularly for inviting me to talk to you all today. And also to, of course, acknowledge that we meet here today on what always was and always will be the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and to acknowledge their ongoing struggle for recognition in their own land, sovereignty over which was never ceded. So, um, I've just turned the presenter off. <laughs> Help. All right, sign up today. All right, I actually don't know what's happened. Have I pushed the wrong button on this thing? There it is. All right, cool. Figured it out. All right. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself so that when I give this talk, um, which will hopefully be less error-free, uh, less error-prone, um, there's a second one. You can understand where I'm coming from and why I think the way I do. So um, I've been a game developer and then a games journalist, and now I'm working as a trade union officer. I'm here today representing Game Workers Unite. Um, game Workers Unite is something you may have seen in the news recently, particularly focused around activities of the most recent Game Developers Conference in the United States. It's kind of a horizontally organized, loose collection of game workers, all with a common interest, which of course is unionizing in video games. Uh, a few of us are in Australia, and, and we're kind of hoping to get things started here, which is why I'm here today. If you want to know more, you can visit the website at gameworkersunite.org. Um, and they've got a Discord channel, and they've got lots of resources and stuff, so it's very useful. I encourage you to get into it. Uh, but I'm also here today because I have a lot of personal experience in this area and it's very important to me. It's kind of a passion area. So um, with your indulgence, I'd like to begin by telling you a story. The story stars a very handsome and relatable protagonist, me. Um, I've always loved games. It's not exactly a, a unique trait in this room, but um, it's true. I always loved games and I wanted to make games. So, well, God, we're talking about 2002, two, three. Uh, I enrolled in my university's first ever games development degree, and four years later I graduated and I began to work as a world designer at a company called uh, Interzone Games in Perth. And I was building the cities and the stadiums for our, um, our online soccer MMO called Interzone Football, which was going to be launched in Brazil. Um, some of you may have heard of Interzone Games or seen the logo around, depending on how old you are, um, because what happened actually made it onto the TV news. Uh, after a couple of good years, the company collapsed in spectacular fashion uh, in about late 2009, another victim of the global financial crisis, which hit so many Australian studios. Um, so the money started to dry up, the rent started to fall behind, and the staff started to leave. We went from about 50 people down to about 15 over the course of a few months as more and more people bailed out because they just couldn't put food on the table. So things started to get pretty hostile. Our CEO, a man named Marty Bricky, who I always enjoy naming and shaming at every opportunity, uh, started, was always sending us emails because he lived and worked in the US and he would fly in and out in his private Learjet. Um, his emails gradually changed in tone from, you know, what a great company, we're all doing great, uh, to please keep working. You know, we can all make it together through this if we all just stick together to, if you start any court action against us, nobody will get paid and I will crush you like a bug. So, Pretty standard CEO stuff. Uh, everything eventually came to a head in early February 2010. That was when the CEO, Marty Bricky, told us that uh, they could no longer afford to keep the studio running, even though we weren't being paid. Uh, but don't worry, he had a great solution. They would come in, they would pack up all of the servers and everything we'd been working on for the last four years, and they would take all of that and they would ship it off to the United States. And there, they would use some kind of emergency money they did have, which was not for us, to hire a crack team of professionals, who weren't us, who would finish off our game uh, and put it to market. And then once the money came rolling in, then and only then would we get paid the money we were already owed. Um, this was basically the last straw for us. When the general manager arrived from the US, he was met by an extremely angry workforce who demanded answers and we, we actually refused to let him move around the building. Everyone was body blocking him, they just wouldn't stop harassing him and, and stop him and let him go anywhere. It was great. Um, he responded by labelling us all trespassers. He barricaded himself in the server room 
and then he called the cops. Uh, the police dutifully arrived, and after hearing both sides of this very complex issue, one being the dirt poor workers who were legally owed more than $650,000 in unpaid wages, and the other being a wealthy boss who refused to pay it, they of course sided with the boss and kicked us out of the building. Um, the owner of the business park then stepped in at the general manager's request and actually banned us from the entire premises. So we had to watch helplessly as everything that we spent years working on was packed up and taken overseas and disappeared along with any hopes of ever being paid what we were owed. And that's where the story ends. We went to the media, we went to the ATO, we went to the federal police, we, you know, we tried everything, but it didn't matter. There was nothing we could do because we weren't organized, we weren't prepared, and we actually didn't know our rights until it was far too late. So why am I telling you this story? Because this is just one of the many ways that game development, while pretending to be a magic career of passion and love and creativity, is absolutely ready and willing to show its fangs when things get tough. Because when the chips are down, there is no difference between a low-paid game worker crunching for 80 hours a week and sleeping under their desk and someone slaving away in a car factory or an oil rig or in a classroom or any other job. Because when I tell you that we are workers, that we have rights, I want you to know that I fucking mean it. All right. So let's get into it. This is a talk about unionizing game workers. Uh, if you want me to talk about why games are art or about the transcendental storytelling power of games and what they say about the human condition, you can get out. I'm sorry, I believe all those things, they are true, but I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes, 50 minutes, talking about wages, conditions, and collective bargaining. Now, yes, I do want to re-emphasize all these things are true. Games are art. Games are powerful. Now, you are the people, we are the people, responsible for building these fantastic worlds, for, for saying something about the human condition, for taking people's imaginations by the hand and, and leading them on a magical journey. Yes, but we are also underpaid, we are also exploited, and some of us can't put food on the table. So it doesn't have to be this way. We can fix it and we can fix it together. So we're going to start at the very beginning. What does it actually mean to organise? What is a union? Um, a lot of people have different ideas about what a union is. If you're in your 30s like I am, and you know most of you look roughly that age, uh, you will have grown up on a steady, relentless diet of propaganda from the Liberal government and from our mainstream media telling you that a union is a corrupt, mafia-like organisation which simultaneously makes its members unfairly wealthy through cushy deals while also somehow taking their money and doing nothing for them um, and using their money to buy drugs. So surely I don't need to tell anybody in Melbourne, the city where you can organise a protest on just about anything in about 15 minutes notice, that this is bullshit. Of course it's bullshit. We all know it. But even people who are union members or who are pro-union but might not have joined yet sometimes have the wrong idea about what a union is. Some people think that joining a union is like taking out a kind of insurance policy, like car insurance, um, in case something goes wrong. Other people think that a union is some kind of super-powered guardian, a protector, a Voltron that you can call in when the boss is doing the wrong thing and get them to sort it out for you. Um, a union can do these things, yes. A union can protect you when things go wrong. Um, anyone who does, who joins the union does gain the ability to transform into a giant robot and fire lasers out of their mouth. Yes, all these things are true, but they are not what a union is really about. A union is the power of working people to stand together and make a difference. That is what a union is. At its most simple and, and most important and most fundamentally true, if there's one thing you take away from this talk, it's that a union is power. And power is everything. The fundamental truth of our economy and the reason that bosses and rulers and kings and, and pharaohs throughout history have for hundreds of years, longer than all of us have been alive, feared and hated and tried to crush unions whenever they find them is because working people hold all of the power and we are working people. And they always have hated unions and tried to crush them because without working people, the world stops. So you need working people to keep working so you can stay wealthy. Without us working, crops don't get harvested, electricity doesn't get generated, roads don't get built, and games certainly don't get made without us. So working people, in a very real and true sense, hold all the power. They have the power to change the world, but they are kept fractured and isolated and afraid 
by an economic system called capitalism, which exploits them, and broken laws made by the rich to bind their hands. Working people manifest our power by combining together to form a union. We can't do anything on our own. That's why we stand together. It's not corruption. It's not magic. And regrettably, it's not a giant robot. But it's certainly not scary unless you're a CEO. But it is powerful. It is power in the truest sense. And it can make change. And it can only be done by standing together. So why do game workers need a union? Well, because we're workers. Because even though this industry is decades old, we are still riddled with crap pay, unreliable work, and unacceptable treatment of employees. Because some of us are working 80 hours a week on endless freelancer contracts, struggling to make ends meet, always at the mercy of someone else's cash flow. We accept these things because we're too afraid to rock the boat. We know there's always someone else out there who will work for less, desperate to land that magical job in gaming, just like we did. Because we work our asses off Day in, day out, most of us earn just over half or less than the average Australian wage. Even our lead developers barely crack the average on a good day. And because people like Bobby fucking Kotick earn more than 300 times what the average Activision employee earns in a year, and that is not okay. It is not okay. The only way to fix these things is by standing together and forming a union. Mm -hmm. um, all right, this is from the Game Developers Association of Australia's most recent, uh, wait, I'm missing a thing here, aren't I? Yes, I am. No, I'm not. Yeah, there we go. Um, this is from the Game Developers Association of Australia's most recent national games industry survey. They've been releasing data over the last few weeks, but this particular bit just came out uh, Wednesday of this week. Look at that. If you can't read that up the back, that says that only 24% of game developers would recommend this industry. It's less than one in four. This is a fantastic industry, and we are all fantastic people. But we can't even get people who work in our industry to unreservedly encourage their friends to join. We are the only ones who can fix this. Workers are the only people, game workers, with the power to make real, lasting improvements in the lives of game workers. We can't wait for politicians to change laws or to give us grants or to hand out much needed funding. If we accept government solutions to problems, then we become dependent on other people to do our fighting for us and we don't learn how to fight. We can't sit quietly and hope that bosses and CEOs will reduce their own pay so that we can increase ours. That has never happened. If we wait for others to give us what we need, then we're encouraging them to simply take it away again and they will take it away. We are the only ones who can fix our industry. And that's as true for games as it is for manufacturing, for construction, for nursing, any industry. You name it, it's all the same. We have to build the strength from within that allows us to set the terms and allows us to defend ourselves. We are the only ones who can fix this. So if it sounds so simple, and it is, and powerful, so why aren't we doing it already? Good question. Thanks for asking. It's very important, so we need to talk about it. I believe there are three main reasons why we aren't unionizing. All of them need to be considered in a holistic discussion. Um, the first one is that we are blinded by passion. We are so devoted to our craft, to our dreams, that we are willing, eager in many cases, to overlook the fact that we are being exploited. We are afraid. Work is hard to come by. Everyone knows that in this room. I don't need to tell you that. Everyone in this room knows everyone else. And you don't want to get a reputation as a troublemaker, so you don't rock the boat. And finally, we simply don't know how. So what do I mean when I say we are blinded by passion? I mean that we are unable to properly and objectively identify when we are being exploited. We know enough about exploitation to identify it in others, but we are too blind to see it in ourselves. Here's a quote from Corey Barlog, the director on the recent God of War reboot at Sony's Santa Monica Studios. You've probably played it or seen someone playing it. Um, Giant Bombs, Brad Shoemaker asked Corey about the hot topic of labor and game development. And in response, Corey speaks for about 600 words. I've edited it at length uh, and basically avoids the question because he can't come out and say bad things about Sony. Um, but the answers he does give, and you can see some of them above, are very telling. 
Look at this. We depend on the passion of our people. Because I cared, says Corey, not because anybody asked me to be there at 3 a.m. It's that level of perfection, that level of drive. Most people are doing it because they love this. That's fucked. I have a lot of respect for Corey, and God of War is an undeniably beautiful and well-made game, but that's messed up. This man is being exploited. We are being exploited. I work every day at my job at the Meat Workers Union with low-paid manufacturing workers in meat processing. These are people who are standing on the poultry line for 10 hours a day, moving pallets, working in cold storage, slicing, gutting, cutting. It's hard work. It's physical work. It's back-breaking work. A lot of people get injured. I'm just trying to imagine any of them saying anything like what Corey is saying about their job, doing my head in. Never going to say, oh, yeah, we stayed back at the factory until 3 in the morning. Nobody asked us to be there. We just, it's that level of perfection. You know, I, I just love gutting chickens. Um, I just love cleaning carcasses so much. I went back and I reorganized all the turkey pallets in the cold storage just because I thought they could be packed more neatly. It's bonkers. No one would ever say that. And you know what? The really messed up part is that nobody would expect them to say that. In fact, if you as a games worker heard someone say something like that about their job, you would say, listen, mate, what is wrong with you? You're being exploited. Why are you doing this to yourself? Yet somehow we give this kind of behavior a free pass when we do it. This isn't healthy, folks. Here's the facts. Most factory workers in Australia are heavily unionized, and we aren't. When the boss asks a factory worker to do overtime, they put their hand and they demand the penalty rates they are legally entitled to. And they won't work until they get them. What do we do? We do it for nothing. We volunteer for it. You know, when the boss says to the factory worker, you're not getting a pay rise this year, even though the cost of living went up this year, you can't have a pay rise. They walk off the job, factory workers, because they're unionized until the boss comes to on his knees, it's always he, and says, please go back to work. I'll give you the pay rise. I'm begging you. What do we do? We shrug and we say, that's all right, Gary. We're still on for fortnight tonight. Fuck off. <laughs> we are so blinded by our passion that we have forgotten what it means to stand up for ourselves. We can't even recognize when we are being exploited. And we're afraid. Look, I get it. I, it makes sense that a lot of people, a lot of us are afraid. I'm deeply sympathetic to that. This, I have been with the union for two and a half years, and I'm 33 years old. It is my first full-time job with a salary in my entire life. That's the, that's the landscape of Australian employment at the moment. All jobs are tenuous and unstable and bad. I understand why we're afraid. It makes sense. You'd be crazy not to be afraid. And a huge portion of us are freelancers or contractors with no rights, and we're desperate to land that magical unicorn, that full-time gig in video games. But when we do manage to land that full-time gig in video games, we sure as hell don't want to upset anyone by asking rude questions about wages and overtime paying conditions. Then we'll lose the magical job in video games. Everyone knows everyone else. Word gets around. Nobody wants to be the sort of person who has to leave the magical unicorn job because they've got a reputation of being the guy who causes too much trouble. And finally, in a very real way, we don't know how. We don't know how to organize. Trade union membership in Australia is an all-time low. It's not a secret for me to tell you that. That's, that's public knowledge. It's an all-time low. Anybody in this room aged 30 or less will have been born and raised in an era where unions have been, in a very real way, removed from the cultural consciousness, except as bad guys to be used as punching bags in the newspaper. Nobody teaches us about unions in schools, even though unions are the reason we have the eight-hour day. They're the reason we have the weekend. They're the reason we have holiday pay, sick leave, equal pay for women, child labor laws, you name it. Unions gave it to us, but we don't talk about it. People just like you and me fought and, and literally died for these rights, but we don't get taught about that anymore. That's a deliberate decision, that, no, no mistake, but that's not the point. That's not what I'm here to talk about. Right now, the simple fact is that many workers in Australia, including us in the games industry, we simply do not know how to unionize or to stand up for ourselves. We wouldn't even know what that means. The words for doing so have been carefully removed from our vocabulary, but we have to reckon with that. There is a whole generation of kids going into the workforce now who don't know what sick leave is. They don't know what holiday pay is. And we are absolutely keen to address all forms of social injustice as games developers. 
but we have a massive blind spot when it comes to this because we simply don't know how. The games industry has done a lot of great work to combat other types of oppression. We are woke as fuck on racism, sexism, transphobia, you name it. We understand how important these issues are. My thing has preferred pronouns on it. I would never see this anywhere else. This is amazing, right? We understand how important it is to stand together and tackle these issues. And we have made incredible strides on these issues. When it comes to economic and financial issues, we turn a blind eye. We don't want to talk about it. Oh, it's just how the industry is, we say to each other, consoling ourselves over a beer at the pub. Hopefully my contract will be renewed. Folks, this is a form of oppression. If you can't plan for your future because your work is so unstable, you're being oppressed. That's not a Monty Python quote, although it sounds like one. I would never do that, I'd never stoop that low. But you are being oppressed. And like all other forms of oppression, it is something we need to talk about and work together to solve. It's no different from racism, sexism, transphobia, any other kind of oppression. You are being oppressed. If you don't have enough money to put food on the table, you don't have enough money to plan for where you're going to live, then you almost certainly don't have enough support in your life to tell the valuable stories that need to be told through games about things like race and identity and self-discovery. You almost certainly don't have enough support in your life to afford to spend time practicing your skills to become a professional game developer or a professional gamer or a pro athlete. You almost certainly don't have enough support in your life to do any of the things you need to do to build yourself a stable career in gaming of any kind because you're being oppressed. And if you are sacrificing your health and well-being to do these things, well, then she you shouldn't have to put yourself in that position. That should not be normal, and we must not allow it to be normal. These are all things that a union, and only a union, can help with. So, we know that we need to fix our industry. And we know that the only way to do it is by staying together and forming a union. Before we can do that, we need to know what we're working with. We need to take a realistic look at our industry, even if that means being harsh. So let's start at the top with the biggest question of all, how many of us are there? Here is the uh, IGEA's latest survey that's released in January this year. These are pretty much the most reliable figures we have on our industry, so let's start here. Um, look at this big number at the top. 928 full-time employees. Nice. All right, sweet. Now to uh, scroll down the page a bit. And, uh, ah, looks like there are a few words missing from that infographic. 928 full-time equivalent jobs. That is a fancy way of saying people in this industry work enough hours to employ 928 people on a full-time basis, all added up. Full-time equivalent jobs is a fancy way of saying not jobs. Now, I understand why the IGEA phrased it the way they did. I'm not here to attack them. I get it. I do. But we need to be realistic about these things. Anyone who has worked in the Australian games industry knows that freelance work and contract work takes up a huge chunk of our landscape. The IGA's data is based on responses from 114 companies. If we flick back to the GDAA report that I mentioned earlier, this is based on responses from 71 companies. Um, already we can see that 40 odd companies have disappeared just between two surveys. So our data becomes even harder to figure out. I'm choosing not to believe that 40 companies folded between the two surveys because I'm an optimist. The GDAA says that 67% of staff employed by their companies are full time. Now if we take the IGA's number of 928 and say that 67% of those people work full time in the industry, then we have a full time employed Australian workforce of just 620 odd people. That's not a lot of people. Now you're asking yourself, why is this dickhead so obsessed with numbers? Because this next step is very important. The idea of a union for game workers uh, isn't new. It's been around for a while. And it's gaining momentum lately as times get tougher. When times get tough, people naturally turn to unions. This is a trend you can notice throughout history. But it's definitely not new. So much of the discussion in our industry in Australia uh, is, is often framed by discussions overseas from places like the USA, Europe and Canada, where there are lots and lots of people in the games industry. And a lot of our discourse is shaped by that culture. And so as a result of that, a lot of game workers in Australia have this idea in our heads that we can create a new union from scratch, a union just for us, 
and that our issues are unique to us alone and that no other union can possibly understand them. I am sorry to say that I am here today to crush that dream. We here in Australia cannot build a union from scratch just for ourselves. Why? Because there are not enough of us. We don't have the kind of enormous industry that other countries have. Even if we accept the IGA's inflated figure of 900 developers, a figure which is inflated with the best of intentions but still inflated is not enough to form an entirely new union from scratch. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere. If we as an industry were to approach the Australian Council of Trade Unions, which is our, our peak body which regulates our unions, and we were to say, listen folks, we want to create an entirely new union and we have at most 900 potential members, three things would happen in order. They would listen very carefully, they would applaud our drive and our motivation, and then they would tell us to get lost and go join an existing union instead. I'm sorry to be harsh, but there are simply not enough game workers in Australia to facilitate the creation of an entirely new union. And you know what? That's okay. Because listen, the issues that we are facing are not unique. We don't stand alone here. Unpaid overtime, which you're supposed to just deal with because you're lucky to be in a creative and passionate job, so you work 80 hours a week and get paid for 40. Living contract to contract, not knowing what to do when the money dries up being asked to work for exposure and finding that six months have passed and there's no intention of making you an employee. These are things that other industries face. There is an existing pool of knowledge and resources and strength that we could and should be drawing from. We don't need to fight these battles on our own. In fact, it would be the height of arrogance to assume, to presume that we are so special that we need a whole new union built from scratch just to handle us. I promised you a concrete plan of action and here it is. Our first step is going to be to organise ourselves. We need to start agitating and campaigning within our own industry and talking to each other to build support for unionisation. That means joining together, it means sharing resources and gathering information, and it means talking honestly and openly about us among ourselves, about why some of us can afford the rent and others can't, about what we can do about that. Once we've done that, I would like to very strongly recommend that we as an industry approach an existing union who has constitutional coverage over our type of work and negotiate with them to extend that support and resources to us. There are several options for unions that we could be approaching. The Media Alliance are the union responsible for entertainment and creative industries to ours, like TV, movies and sports. Professionals Australia is another. They cover software engineers and technical workers. There's also the USU or the ASU. The name changes depending on which state you're in. They can cover office workers of all kinds. For my money, the best choice is the Media Alliance. Their constitutional coverage allows them to cover everyone in the games industry. Developers, marketers, YouTubers, streamers, voice actors, eSports players, the lot. Plus, they have decades of experience dealing with creative industries and freelance work and contract work. And perhaps most compellingly of all, they're the only union that's actually keeping an eye on the game space to the point where they rang me up once they found out this talk was on, asked if they could come along and meet all of you. Some of them are here right now. Hi. No other union did that. Once we have all this information and we can have a dialogue open with a union about what we need, we can start agitating for them to provide us with resources and support. We cannot expect to put our hand up and ask a union to come in and suddenly dump salaried organisers and pay for events and pay for stands and do all the other work required to organise ourselves. We have to do it ourselves and then we have to approach them. This means that workplace visits, it means in-person digital organising with each other, it means talking to each other about conventions and events, it means pooling our money together to pay for staff to represent us in court, at the bargaining table, in the political arena. Through a union we gain support and representation and most importantly we gain power, power to take control of our industry so that it works for us, delivering more secure work, more promising careers and more opportunities. The first thing we need to do is start gathering that information. Now, myself and a group of other game workers who are interested in organising are launching a new anonymous survey to collect real useful information on the games industry. I'd like to urge everyone here, please, and everyone watching on stream, to head to gameworkers.com.au and take the survey. It will only take about five minutes of your time and it will help us build an accurate picture of what our industry really looks like and what people are getting paid, what hours they're working, all the stuff that isn't covered in industry lobby group reports like the IGEAs. Unlike other surveys, this one is not for bosses to promote their studios. This is for workers to provide us with real actionable data on things like wages and employment conditions and work hours. Without this information, we cannot organise. 
or at least it'll be very hard. I know we don't normally talk about these things, but we need to break the stigma around money because only by an open dialogue about wages can we understand who is being exploited and what the average pay is and how to fix it. While you're at the website, please also join us on the mailing list and follow us on Twitter. We have a Twitter account. We'll be spreading further information about the movement to unionise here in Australia. This isn't going to be a quick thing, but we have to start somewhere, so hopefully we can start here today. The only way that we can fix the issues plaguing our industry is by standing together as a union. And the only way to realise that union here in Australia is by organising ourselves and negotiating with an existing union to represent and support us. It is the most concrete, practical plan of action that we have. I'd like to thank you all for having me. That's pretty much the end of the talk. I'll leave this screen up here to remind you all to please hit the website, take the survey and tell all of your friends if you can. We want to hear from everyone involved in games, not just developers, streamers, YouTubers, esports, pros, PR, marketing, everyone. If you work in games, you're a game worker and it would be wonderful if you could take the survey. We need to hear from you. All right, thanks again, everyone. Um, I guess I'd like to throw the floor open for questions. I'll do my best to answer them. I got up at three o'clock this morning, so please keep your questions to four to five words maximum. <laughs> thanks very much. Hello. Oh, we got a mic? Sick. Two mics. Hello. Four words. Uh, hmm. um, so while while the industry is small. No. <laughs> Sorry, please. <continue. laughs> um, yes. While our industry is, is small, I think the for a lot of us the relation between worker and boss is quite yes porous. Um, yes. Do you have any? resources um, or just general tips for people who uh, want to take an anti-capitalist approach to being the person who has the money um, sure. and working with friends and yeah. um, um, all that. The, the, the question is, is tough. I understand. I'm sympathetic to that deeply. Um, we've all been in that same situation. In terms of resources, not really. The only way to, the only resource we have is honesty and truth. And you have to talk to your boss about what your expectations are and why you expect to have a reasonable profit share from the operation. Um, all I can say is that that's a tough conversation. The sooner you have it, the better. And the more of you have it, the better. If you go to the boss on your own and say, look, I understand that you're my mate and I want to help you, but the cost of living went up 2% this year and you didn't give me a wage rise, um, and you have that conversation on your own, it won't go very well. But if you have a conversation with all nine or ten other people in the studio, it's going to go better. There's no, in an ideal world, what I would like unions to be doing, and something that I, my criticism I have of the union movement, is that we don't do enough to promote worker cooperatives and provide resources for transitions into those cooperatives. In an ideal world, I would like to be able to be in a position to support you, transform your studio into a cooperative that's equally owned by all of you. At the moment, you're right, your boss is a capitalist and you're a worker. Um, your boss is also a worker in terms of his relationship to the bank who lent him money. Um, the dialogue gets a bit messy sometimes. But the point is, there is no magic bullet for that. It's just a discussion you need to have and you need to say, look, if you are truly my friend, you understand that I need to pay the rent and you need to increase my wages. Oh, sorry, you meant what if you are the boss? You're the boss. All right. Yes. Um, I, are you saying people are coming to you with questions? Uh, like we don't employ anyone right, yeah. right now. Yep. Um, but we want to yep. make sure that we are doing it right. Yep. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of people in this room in similar situations. Mm. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, in terms of, sorry, I understand the question better now. In terms of resources for correctly employing someone, yes. Uh, definitely. That's something that the Media Alliance in particular, and I was having a discussion with one of their organisers earlier today, um, the correct wages for game development is going to vary discipline by discipline. And this is something that um, in terms of if you were a programmer, for example, you could conceivably come under the software award, um, software engineering award under the professionals award. Does everyone understand the award and the wage system in general? Or should I do a quick cap of it? Is everyone? 
Okay, so we have a three-tier uh, wage system in Australia. We'll start at the bottom. The bottom tier is the NES, that's the National Employment Standards. That's the absolute minimum wage anyone can get paid. You can't go below that, no matter what your job. Above that, you have the award wages. Um, the award wages are specific to uh, trades, disciplines. So you have a black coal processing award, you have a meat processing award, you have a manufacturing award. These are all specific to, if you work in this industry, this is your minimum rate of pay. So that sits above the national employment standards. And then on top of that, you have enterprise bargaining agreements. And what these are are specific uh, agreements that are usually at one company or at one location rather. So you might say all the, the workers at one operation agree that they want to have their own agreement that covers them, and they put that together and they and the boss sign off on it, usually after a protracted and bitter dispute. Uh, and that then has to, by law, be better than the award. So that's the best, if you can manage a triangle, the enterprise bargaining level sits at the top. It's the best one. Um, and by law, it has to be better than the award. That's called the better off overall test or boot test. And often you might hear, for example, some of you might have read Coles recently after a long and protracted and bitter dispute with some of their employees, their agreement was found to fail the boot test. And so all their employees, that, that agreement was scrapped and all their employees had their wages changed to the old agreement. So to answer your question in a roundabout way, it depends on the discipline of the person. And this is certainly resources that a union like the Media Alliance can help you with. Um, but ideally, in terms of um, as long as your wages are sufficiently high that they would meet any given award, you're basically in the clear. Um, you can have an individual contract with any worker as long as it is superior to the award, that would be relevant. And it's pretty easy to do that because in some cases there is no award for game development in some disciplines. Like if you're a game designer, you would probably fall under the miscellaneous award, which isn't very good. Um, and it would be very easy for you to beat that. Now, I want to be clear what I'm saying is I don't encourage you to do the legal minimum. Um, I would encourage you to do what allows your employee to put food on the table and improve their lives in a material way. Um, but in terms of doing the legal minimum and staying out of trouble, it's actually very easy to do and the resources that, that, that the Media Alliance could certainly help you with, any union could help you with. And um, it would be very easy to make sure you're legally in the clear on that front. But I would encourage you to, to come up with your employee like, and talk about you know, what, because it's very easy to draft an individual agreement. It's very easy. There are templates on the Fair Work Commission and that, that kind of stuff um, that would provide them with enough leave, sick leave, holiday pay, and enough wages to easily surpass any legal minimum award. And the important part is that their life is materially improving every year. And if you are friends with them and you can actually see that progress, then you know that's easy enough for you to do. Does that answer the question, or is it still? Because the answer is really vague. You know, like the the legal the legal structure around payment for game workers is. That's the answer. So in a very real practical sense, the best answer I can give you right now is to actually make sure in person that you've crafted a pretty decent agreement with your employee and make sure that checking in on them, their life is going well and they're getting paid enough. In terms of meeting the legal minimum, very easy because the legal minimum is so great. And that's something that we as a union, if we all organise together as workers, we can establish by going through the Fair Work Commission who review the awards every year, we can establish these precedents, we can establish base rates of pay for our industry and set precedents. And that's something that we really need to be doing because, like I just said, by shrugging really expansively, those precedents aren't there. So if we're all organised together, we can approach the Fair Work Commission en masse and say, listen, you need to get your shit together because there are like a thousand of us working and we don't have a legal minimum wage. And there'll be some pushback to that, of course, but that is a really important step to establishing clarity for people like you who want to know what can I pay this person rather than just saying, hey, Gary, what do you want to get paid? You know, you'll be able to say, look, here's the award, and I'd like to offer you 10% more than that. But at the moment, your best practical step is to just understand them personally and say, look, this is what I can offer you, and if this isn't enough, then you can tell me what you're going to need and we'll come to an agreement. Does that make more sense? Yeah, the answer is, is it's going to take time to establish that legal precedent, but we need the only way it's going to happen is if we organise, because there's no way the Fair Work Commissioner is just going to show up at the doors of you know, a game company and say, like, oh, what are you guys getting paid? Saw this out, it's not going to happen. They hate workers. Sorry, next question. Yes. Um, I have two questions, and I hope the answer to the first one is really quick. Sure. Um, for those of us who are community leaders, yes. um, can we come to you and help out with stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, please. Uh, 
we're going to hopefully be starting a Discord server as well, so we can organize this kind of stuff. Um, but we're definitely going to need people. Well, you know, I'm talk you're talking about an organizational role. Mm. Um, yes, absolutely. Th this isn't going to work without you. So I'm begging you, please. <laughs> Great. Um, and I then the other question is, uh, as a freelancer, I'm very, very worried about just being very easily replaceable. So therefore, I do you know, go lower. There's yep. a lot of people who want my job. Yes. And it's fine if games are um, released subpar because it's up to marketing, not mm. how good a game is, whether it does well. So yep. do you think other industries do that? And is that something that the MEA Alliance thing know about? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll answer the question in a broad capacity and then I'll let um, Adam speak a bit about what the Media Alliance does. Um, Adam's the regional director for the MEA in Victoria and Tasmania, so he's a pretty big shot. Um, <laughs> thanks, Adam. Uh, in terms of freelancer work, I understand. I've been there. Um, I did a couple of hard years as a freelancer. It fucking sucks. The problem with freelance work, obviously, is that, yes, everyone's always looking to undercut each other. Stop that. <laughs> The power that a union has in the freelancer space is to organise and set wage floors through which we will not drop. And that is to say that we, I will not do 3D art for less than this price. I will not do narrative design for less than this price. Because me and my colleagues have agreed this is unsustainable. And if we go below this, we can't afford to eat. And that means that no matter where the boss turns, they are met time after time with someone saying, it'll cost you this, it'll cost you this, it'll cost you this. And they can't get anything below that. Now, I know that sounds dumb because obviously you've got to eat, so you want to take the job. But then what happens when someone undercuts you again? Or what happens when someone undercuts them? That The only person winning there is the boss. As freelancers, and I know this is hard because you want that work, you've got to eat. But the only way that freelancers can make the market work for them, and if the market's not working for regular people, then what's the fucking point of the market, is to agree that wages must not go below a certain point or prices for certain jobs must not go below a certain point. Because if a boss can just go to someone else and do the work for 10% less, then they will. Of course they will. So you have to agree, and this is something that a union is really good at, and combining together and making sure we share resources, we share rates, because no one wants to talk about money. So a union is really good for everyone combining together and saying, listen, this is the absolute minimum that we are willing to accept on this. We will not go further. And that places upwards wage pressure on that job, which is good for you, because that means you have more money in your lives. And at the end of the day, if the economy only exists to put money into the lives of workers in a very moral and real sense, you talk about business profits and all that, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't fucking matter. You can't put food on the table, then what's the point of the economy? So you need to get together and organize the economy in such a way that bosses have no choice but to pay you decent wages. And that means standing together and saying, I will not betray my comrade who was willing to do that work for $20 an hour by doing it for $19 an hour. It hurts you in the long run. Sure, right now you get the job, but six weeks down the line, someone does it for $18. It's a race to the bottom. Everyone loses except the boss who laughs all the way to the bank. So that's why a union is so important for freelancers. Also, the membership costs are tax deductible. <laughs> Adam. Uh, look, first up, thanks for uh, what's been a really uh, great presentation. Thank you, Adam. Um, look, I think it's important um, to look at where the end game is here because I, I know as freelancers you can feel uh, powerless. It's, it's um, a, a more disparate position to be in than so many uh, workers throughout our economy. But the important thing is to realise you're not alone and unfortunately freelancers are becoming the, the new norm. Um, you know, we as a union movement estimate that about 40% um, uh, plus uh, employees, workers now in this country are employed in non-standard employment forms. That includes things like freelancing, contracting, what have you. So this is becoming the new norm for, for better or for worse. Um, our experience has been predominantly with freelancers. Uh, so we, we look after and represent uh, people in, in the media, um, performers, um, in, in fact many people already in the games space, or some at least, are, are members by virtue of the fact that they are, for example, voice actors or they are technicians in film and TV who then gravitate to the, the games industry. Um, and there is a hope story for freelancers, and that is that in several of these industries that have become more union over time, we've managed to set national minima. So for example, voice actors, who are some of the, the, the most atomised, disparate workers around, they are almost always employed 
as contractors on ABNs rather than employees. Mm. They have a national rates card, which was set some years ago, which by and large is adhered to by employers. That's transparent, it's on our website, that's updated every year to meet the, the, the increased cost of living uh, that sets a, a national minima per hour, per day, what have you. And that's in general followed. Uh, and then those workers got the right to negotiate above that amount. Mm. Um, similarly, in the, in the film uh, and acting space, I, I, so an hour ago just came from a meeting with the film crew that in the state uh, are negotiating with their colleagues all around the country for a better deal for international um, film work. Um, so they're the cameramen and women, uh, are the technicians. Um, they have a national agreement, um, and we're, we're attempting to build on that, a, a new national agreement that sets minima across the country. So whatever job you're on, you are get, getting paid at least X amount, you're getting at least whatever loadings, and then above and beyond that, you can uh, negotiate. Now, the majority of these people are not employees in the traditional sense. They are freelancers, they are contractors. So while our economy and our industrial relations system um, isn't designed for the modern economy, it's not designed for freelancers and contractors, mm -hmm. unions are able to strike those deals with employers. Um, we aren't able to do it by just asking, though. Yeah. It all comes from increased membership. And the reason why performers in this country, um, despite the fact that they're so um, uh, insecure in their employment, um, have got reasonably good employment conditions, is that they're about three quarters plus uh, union. Yeah, that's right. I mean, like what Adam's talking about is, is what we've been covering in the last hour, is solidarity. If you're not standing together with your workers, then you're basically undercutting each other, especially in the freelancing space, and you're the only one who'll pay the price for that. And I can tell you from experience in my own job working with meat processing plants that the plants where we have 80, 85, 90% union members, they are the best plants, the best pay, the best production levels, the best conditions. It's not magic. It's not corruption, it's just people staying together and saying, we will not work for less than this. And if you want us to, you can go fuck yourself. And that's how it happens. And you have to do the same as freelancers because you're workers, it's no different. I know you're all hungry and you, you, know, you need to get that next job and I deeply appreciate that. I've fallen behind on my rent all the time as a freelancer, but in the long run, it only hurts you to go below certain wages and it only makes you better if all of you agree that this is the minimum we will accept and we will go no further. Um, next question. Uh, hi, Tim. Um, hi. You've successfully reaffirmed my belief that unions are heaps sick. Thank you. Sick. Um, nice. But I've got a, a bit of a tough question. Sure. I was reading an article on the tram the other day on the way home from my normie job <laughs> that um, it was about to the note printing, about note printing Australia. I don't know if you've read this article. No, I haven't. So. Uh, we'll flash back a little bit. Reserve Bank of Australia uh, advised the government recently that uh, av an average annual wage increases need to be around 3.5% to achieve average yes. inflation of 2.5%. Right. Yep. So yep. RBA says wages need to increase annually about 3.5%. Uh, Note Printing Australia, a wholly owned subsidiary of the RBA, stopped work on Friday demanding a 3.5% pay rise rather than yeah. the industry average rate of 2% that the bank offered them. Mm. Um, that sucks. It does. And that's really depressing. Yes. How do we keep going when the people who are give, like paying lip service going, no, it needs to be 3.5% are offering to? Oh, yes, I agree. Um, it does suck. You know, a realistic assessment of the country's industrial relations landscape is that it sucks. That's a rational assessment of the economy. It sucks. That's not being pessimistic, it's accurate. Um, the long answer, and the answer that I believe in is a depressing answer, is that things like that are indicative of a broader trend, which is it will get worse before it's get better. You can only push people so far. You know, like history shows that when you exploit the working class to the point where they can't eat anymore, they get angry and they kill you. I'm not suggesting we go and kill the governor of the Reserve Bank. <laughs> But I'm just saying that that's, history shows that that's what happens. Now, I'm obviously disgusted and disappointed with them for doing that, but it's, they, they can only push their workers so far. And if the workers, go on, the workers have gone on strike, which I like 100% support, yes, solidarity with that. And I hope they go on strike for as long as it takes to bring them to their knees and they come back and say, yes, we'll give you that 3%. But the only way, I mean, this is just a thought exercise, right? Like you, you can all imagine 
that if we all stopped working tomorrow and we said we will not go back to our jobs until things get better, all of us, if we all walked off the job in every industry, if 19 million people took to the streets tomorrow and said we will not work until things are better, things would get better like that. Fuck. That's not crazy. Like, that's a rational assessment of what would happen. If we all walked off the job, that would happen. So why aren't we doing it? The answer is because we're terrified and we need money to live, right? We all know that. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. It's just depressing to talk about, so we don't talk about it. But we all understand on a theoretical level that if we stopped working until things got better, things would get better very fast. And that's what we're going to have to see. And I'm, I'm not going to tell you that's going to happen tomorrow, but what I will tell you is that historically, as you push people further and further, people get more and more willing to do things like that. And that's when the economy crashes, that's when you have depressions, and that's when emperors get overthrown and eaten. And that's what happens. So, like, I, I you know, I appreciate that the, the, this, this wholly owned subsidiary is pulling crap like that. Of course they are. They're incentivized to do that in our economy. Of course they want to limit wage, wage growth to inflation. They want to peg it at that. Or less. Um, they're incentivized to do that in our system. I'm not angry at them. I'm disappointed, obviously, but that's the system we live in. It encourages them to behave in that manner. So, of course, they behave in that manner, but it's still stupid. It's still disappointing. At the end of the day, they're going to get that come up and eventually. You can't keep doing this, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. Yes, I believe that. I wish it wasn't true, but I do believe it. And that's just how it's going to have to be until it gets better. But look, if, if, if that sort of thing disgusts you, join your union. The only way to legally take safe industrial action in Australia because of how fucked our laws are is to join a union. If you go on strike and you're not a member of a union and you're not meeting all the requirements which are extremely onerous, you will just get sacked immediately. And you can be personally fined up to $10,000. That's You can actually be fined $10,000 for going on strike without having ticked all the boxes. That's how bad our laws are. If you want to do things, if you want to change that kind of situation, you need to join your union. Maybe you're not a game worker, maybe you're just here as a hobbyist, maybe you work in in IT and you get paid an actual reasonable salary. Um, but you and anyone listening, you need to join your union because that's the only way to fix this. It's not going to happen any other way. You know, it's, it's either that or we just start rioting in the streets and that's bad for everyone. I don't want that. No one wants that. So the only way to fix this is to start joining together in your union. Yes, it sucks, but that's how it is. Sorry, we've got another... Yes, we have another question. Sorry, guys, this one has to be really quick. Because yeah. Oh, yeah, we have six minutes. No worries. So this has been good. Sweet. As a games educator, so I'm a lecturer that teaches games. Yep. Can I be part of two unions? So an education union and hypothetically a games union if it comes down to the other way. You, um, so the, the, the union can only represent people based on its constitutional coverage, right? So you would come under the education union, which would be if you're at a tertiary level with the NTEU. Um, because if you were to join, say, the Media Alliance or Professionals Australia, they simply cannot, by their constitution, cover you. The NTU would challenge it. They wouldn't, actually. They'd be like, sure, whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, like, generally, unions don't poach from each other. It does happen, but generally, turf wars are pretty, pretty few and far between. Um, you could not join a games union, would be my answer to you. I mean, you could try, and certainly you would be welcome, comrade, but um, generally, I think you would be more advised to join the NTU because what you want when you join your union is to make sure you're in the right place so that if you do go blows with your employer, they can't then challenge your union representation and have it dismissed. The worst possible scenario would be for you to join a games union, go through industrial dismissal, unfair dismissal case, and it gets to the Fair Work Commission and the, your boss's employer says your union representation is invalid. And suddenly your lawyer, who you don't have to pay for because you're a union, suddenly your lawyer just gets chucked out of the court and you've got nothing. So that's that you don't want that. That's terrible. Um, so basically you want to make sure you're in the right place and my advice to you would be that the education union would be a much better place because your constitutional coverage is locked in that way. Yeah. Um, so we're out of time, aren't we? Oh, Van, do you have a question? Sure, Van, go nuts.
We at Mass outside the Aged Building and were joined by representatives of the FSU, which is the Financial Services Union, and the CFMEU, and the ETU, and the whole broad family of the Australian Union movement. When you are a member of a union in this country, you are not actually alone. You're part of the largest membership organisation of anything across the culture and across the economy. There are now two million of us in the community, and if you're looking at the campaign to get behind the whole challenge of changing the rules and re-establishing that's actually the community that you join when you become a union member. And I don't want people to think that it's a, a, you know, a case of an atomised workplace or just one enterprise or just one job. It is actually like a huge coordinated movement of people across industries who support one another. And if we're looking at the games that, that we're fighting for at the moment, it's that combined sense of, of community across so many different sectors that is giving us the power to seize the platform to change the rules. Thank you. Um, all right, we're out of time, aren't we? Yes. Oh, Chad. Yep. Um, <laughs> we can use this one. Test. Okay. There we go. Uh, if anyone has any questions, can they uh, shoot them over to the Twitter yeah. handle up there? Yep. Yep. So go. Just uh, all the contact details there. The website also has a mailing list on it um, with an email address, so which is just gwuaustralia at gmail dot com, I think. Um, but yeah, just shoot them through and we'll answer them. You know, there's, uh, I think, we're kind of organising in the Game Workers Unite International Discord. I think it's about five or six of us. So someone will answer your question. Yeah. Uh, it's Burgerdrome with. <laughs> All right, you don't need spelling on that. Great. No worries. Great. Okay. Um, thank you, Tim. A huge round of applause. Thanks, everyone.